And we're going to jump right into a topic many of you have a lot of interest in, that's blood clots. Joining me now to enlighten and inform is Dr. Jack Ansel. He is the former chair of medicine at Lenox Hill Hospital, and he's a professor of medicine at Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine. In addition, Dr. Ansel is on the medical and advisory board for the patient advocacy group, the National Blood Clot Alliance. Dr. Ansel, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, have, thank you for having me here, Robert. Yes, I'm, I'm very pleased to have uh, such a um, well-esteemed uh, expert on this topic. Um, now, a thrombosis is essentially a term that's used to refer to blood clots that occur in the veins of the body. And it's broken down into a couple, um, several categories, but the most common ones are deep vein thrombosis, or DVT, and pulmonary embolism, or PE. So can you go over what the difference is uh, between DVT and PE, and, okay. and what's the relationship between the two? Sure. So uh, most patients, so most people, uh, don't, uh, are not that familiar with the term thrombosis, but I think everybody is familiar with blood clots. And um, when, a blood, when the blood clots in one of the veins of the leg, uh, it's called a deep vein thrombosis. And, we, and specifically in the deep veins of the legs, there are superficial veins and deep veins. The superficial veins are less dangerous, less problematic, although can still cause some problems. Um, and we call that superficial venous thrombosis. But uh, the one that's more serious is called deep venous thrombosis, or DVT. And when... Uh, a small part of the blood clot, or sometimes even the entire blood clot, uh, breaks away and travels up through the veins toward the heart and into the lungs. It's called a pulmonary embolism. Embolism is a medical term for something like a blood clot that has traveled from one part of the body to another. And so a pulmonary embolism is uh, almost always uh, a blood clot that has formed someplace else, usually in the legs, and breaks off and travels to the lungs. Uh, both of these conditions are, are serious. Uh, when you have clots in the legs, blood clots in the legs, it's, it's painful, it's discomforting, it, it can be very problematic. But what's most serious, if it goes to the lungs, and uh, that can be a fatal condition. Uh, approximately 100,000 people die each year from pulmonary embolism, from blood clots that break off and travel to the lung. So this is clearly a very serious problem. Yeah. And uh, so what are the risk factors for someone to develop a blood clot? Well, probably uh, the most common or important risk factor, one that we can't modify, is age. So these blood clots occur more commonly in older individuals, really pretty uncommon in teenagers or young adults, uh, although they do occur, but uh, certainly less common. So age is a major factor. Other things like obesity is a factor in uh, increasing the risk of having a blood clot. Uh, cancer certainly is uh, a factor. Uh, prolonged immobility, meaning lying around for, you know, and I don't just mean lying in bed for a few hours, but people who are sick and are, are bedridden for days on end, immobility is a factor. Having surgery is another risk factor. Uh, certain medical conditions uh, can predispose to blood clots in the legs or pulmonary emboli. And uh, there are some hereditary factors that can occur. And these uh, tend, in general, tend to be more common in men than in women, but uh, not that much different. Yeah, well, I, I am a person that had a blood clot at one time, and that's why I have such an interest in this particular topic. And I got it uh, from sitting at a computer for too long. Oh, good. Yeah. That's, but that's, I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, But one thing they did try to rule out with me was uh, genetic uh, issues, and uh, there was none. But what do you, as a physician, what do you see? Is it What do you see in most? Is it the guy that's playing video games for 24 hours, or is it people that have a coagulopathy? Well, I think the most common situation uh, is uh, where blood clots develop are patients who have an underlying cancer. It's a, a really a high uh, association. Uh, individuals who are sick with other medical conditions that predispose to inflammation, which is a factor in predisposing to blood clots. Uh, certainly hereditary factors are important, but some of the most common hereditary factors 
that individuals have often by themselves will not cause a blood clot, but when they're combined with other things. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Sure. We all hear of people who sit on airplanes for long travel, long flights, and can uh, develop a blood clot in their leg. That's right. And, you know, these are flights that are usually o certainly over five hours, but flights overseas that are six, seven, eight to ten hours. And if you're really immobile, meaning sitting in your chair, not moving around, not moving your legs, there is a uh, the, the blood becomes very static, and there's a risk of having a blood clot. But, you know, millions of people fly and don't have a problem. Those who are at most risk in this situation are individuals who are on long flights like this, who are immobile, not getting up, moving around, but also may have a hereditary predisposition or may also have obesity or other conditions. So it's usually a, a combination of factors that uh, predispose. And with the hereditary problems, it's that way too. For for most ones, um, it's really those who have other factors as well. Okay. Now, I remember when I got mine, uh, as soon as I got up, I felt pain in my leg, and I, I pretty much already knew. Um, and then as time went on, it got warm and all that. But can you give my audience... Uh, general signs and symptoms of both DVT and PE and, you know, what they might be feeling so they might know they have to go to the emergency room? So patients, first of all, you know, there are many, many problems that can uh, confuse the situation and have symptoms sim like a DVT or a PE. Right. But when you have a blood clot in your leg, can, you generally have swelling uh, in the calf or in the thigh. Uh, discomfort or pain is very common. Sometimes redness of the thigh or calf. Uh, warmth as well and usually it's one leg not both legs when when you have both legs involved it's often due to other conditions mm. um, so those are some of the things swelling discomfort pain redness warmth uh, that one might experience uh, for a pulmonary embolism uh, individuals who have that uh, generally experience the sudden onset of shortness of breath uh, sometimes chest pain uh, often there is anxiety about not getting enough air in or feeling that you're not getting enough air in. So you become very anxious, uh, and in some cases you may cough up some blood. So those are some of the signs or symptoms of a pulmonary embolism. Okay, so if, if there's a patient and a person that starts developing these type of symptoms, what's your recommendation to them? Well, they really need to see, uh, well, not just see their physician. Uh, generally, they probably need to go to an emergency room. Right, right. They need to call their primary care doctor if they have one. But uh, generally, these things are diagnosed in the emergency room, and it's important to get there quickly. Now, again, it's, it's, um, it, there are so many other things, such as uh, injuries to the legs or infections or pneumonia or other things that can can appear to be uh, a blood clot. So, you know, you, you have to go to a physician. You have to get a specific test to uh, establish the diagnosis. Right. Now, speaking of diagnosis, how do you diagnose someone with a blood clot? What, what well, test do you run? I think that uh, this is a situation where you actually absolutely need to have a positive test, and it's usually an imaging test, imaging meaning an x-ray of some sort where you actually can see it. Um, even if you have a very high suspicion, uh, you cannot be uh, definitive in your diagnosis until you have a, a, some type of positive imaging test. Now, for the legs, uh, the most common test today is an ultrasound. Right. And with an ultrasound, you actually, by the sound waves, you can image or see the blood clot. And uh, for a pulmonary embolism, it's usually a CT scan, a CAT scan, that uh, one can look at the veins and, and arteries in the, heart, in the lungs and make a diagnosis. There are, there are some blood tests that one would do, but uh, they are most um, helpful in excluding the possibility of a blood clot. There are really no blood tests that one can do to establish the diagnosis. Right, very good. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the treatment, and I remember going through this, and I, I don't know if it's the same, but what is the typical course of the treatment now? So now, all patients, now and then and in the future, mm -hmm. all patients will be treated with a blood thinner or an anticoagulant. And um, typically, uh, when a patient has this problem, they're admitted to the hospital to get 
uh, an intravenous or a subcutaneous uh, blood thinner called heparin. Um, and then they're switched to an oral drug, which is called Coumadin. And those are common. That's the common treatment that's been used for the last uh, 50, last 50 years or so. Um, and you stay on Coumadin, this blood thinner, for a number of months, depending on what causes your blood clot and, and a number of other factors. Uh, today, uh, for the first time in the last, uh, I'd say last uh, half a dozen years, we have a number of new oral blood thinners uh, that are work different than Coumadin. Now, I talk about Coumadin because I think most people have heard that that drug, heard of that drug, they're familiar with it, their parents or somebody, a relative has been on it. It's a very common oral blood thinner or anticoagulant. And now we have a number of new drugs that are much simpler to use. They don't require the monitoring that you need with Coumadin. And um, they appear to be even safer and just as effective, maybe even more effective. Yes, yeah, you see the commercials on TV all the time. Um, and I, I'll, I'll add, uh, Robert, that in some very severe cases, uh, well, let me just say that blood thinners don't dissolve the blood clot. They simply prevent more clotting from occurring. And your body, through its own defense mechanisms, dissolves the blood clot over time. Um, there, there is a drug or there are drugs that are uh, helpful in actually helping to dissolve the blood clot uh, in very severe cases, particularly of pulmonary embolism. Uh, these may be used. The problem is that they're associated with a high risk of bleeding. And so you have to balance the risk of using one of these drugs versus the benefit of getting rid of the blood clot. And that's a delicate balance that every physician has to make a decision, um, but these are not used in the everyday average case of a blood clot. They're usually only used in the most severe cases. Very good. Now, now after treatment, what's the risk of developing another blood clot? Well, it depends on what the cause of the initial event is. So if you have a blood clot, I don't know about your case, but if you uh, go to the hospital and have surgery and are in bed afterwards and have a blood clot as a result of that, which is not uncommon, um, that's called a transient risk factor, meaning uh, it's a, a reversible risk factor, something that happened that led to the blood clot and you get treated and it's no longer present. So if you have a transient risk factor, treatment with a blood thinner is usually only for three to six months or so in most cases, and then it stopped. And the risk of recurrence is perhaps a one, two, three percent per year. So that's a fairly small risk. On the other hand, if you have an underlying risk factor such as cancer uh, or some other conditions that that don't go away, that they're they're permanent or they're chronic, then and you're treated, then the risk after therapy can be fairly high, uh, perhaps ten percent per year. Um, that doesn't mean everybody gets another blood clot because if I say 10% per year, that means 90% of people don't have that problem. Right. But still, 10% is considered a high risk. And so uh, one usually will continue anticoagulant uh, blood thinner therapy for perhaps a number of years. And most importantly, for a large number of patients who develop a blood clot in their legs or their lungs, uh, without any underlying uh, risk factors that are that are knowable that the, the, you know that one can find out or any other conditions, um, that is just a spontaneous event. Those also have a high risk of recurrence, and that's also about perhaps about ten percent per year. All right, now, uh, Doctor Ansel, can you talk about um, the relationship between uh, atrial fibrillation and blood clots? So atrial fibrillation is a condition in the heart where your heart is not beating regularly. And in one of the chambers called the atrium, um, the heart is just sort of uh, quivering a lot. And the blood is not actively moving as much, so it can be static and, and blood clots can form. And those blood clots can go past through the heart into the circulation and particularly when they leave the heart, one of the areas that they, they tend to go to is the head, through the carotid arteries. And, uh, and it can cause a stroke. And these are very small clots. These are, these are really pinpoint uh, type clots. They don't have to be a large, large clot mm -hmm. uh, to, to occlude a small vessel in the brain and have a devastating effect. So uh, with atrial fibrillation, patients who develop that, 
um, an anticoagulant or a blood thinner is standard therapy for most patients, not everyone, but for most patients, and uh, to prevent strokes because if a blood clot goes to the brain, that causes a stroke. And uh, without treatment, uh, in patients who have atrial fibrillation, which is very common in the elder population, uh, the risk is on average about 5% per year to have a stroke, uh, but there are some patients who have other risk factors and it can increase to 10 or 15% per year uh, of having a stroke. So this is a, um, an important uh, condition that needs to be treated with a blood thinner. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, you mentioned previously one of the risk factors is cancer. Can you explain the relationship between blood clots and cancer? So there is a strong relationship. Uh, individuals with cancers have a high risk of developing blood clots, and it may be um, as much as 20 to 30 percent of patients who have cancers will have a blood clot develop over the course of their cancer, as, and particularly with chemotherapy, because that also adds to the risk. Now, there are certain cancers that have a very high risk of blood clotting, and there are other cancers that are much less. So, for instance, pancreatic cancer, which is really a devastating cancer, uh, has a very high risk of having blood clots with it, or ovarian cancer is another one, brain cancer is another one, and then there are cancers where the risk is quite low, but overall, it probably to a 20 to 30 percent incidence. The other thing to keep in mind is that those patients uh, who present with a blood clot and you don't know why they've developed it, in other words, it's one of those what we think is spontaneous blood clotting cases, and we never find an underlying risk factor at the time they come into the hospital, if you follow those patients, about 5 to 10% of such patients will develop or will, will be able to diagnose over the next six months a cancer. And uh, in retrospect, it was that underlying cancer, which was not apparent, that likely caused the blood clot. Very interesting. Wow, I didn't know anything about that. That's great. Um, now, um, I told you about my situation. Obviously, you shouldn't be sitting for <laughs> four hours at a time. But right. um, for my audience, what can they do to prevent blood clots? So um, a couple of things, I'd say. First of all, most, many of the blood clots occur in hospitalized patients or in people with other illnesses that have been discharged from the hospital. So it's very common if you're hospitalized to uh, be put on a low dose of a blood thinner, usually a heparin, not, not Coumadin, but a heparin-like product, mm -hmm. uh, a low dose of that to prevent blood clots from occurring. If you're having surgery or if you've had a heart attack or whatever it is, uh, is very common. And in fact, uh, for your audience, uh, they should know that if they go to the hospital, that they should ask their doctor about that. What is my risk for having a blood clot? Do I need a blood thinner to prevent it? So that is one common way we prevent it. But also, uh, individuals should know that uh, sitting on a plane without moving for six or eight hours at a time is, is also a risk factor. Uh, and that they should exercise their legs, get up and walk around uh, periodically, and, and not just uh, sit like a couch potato on the plane for a, an extended trip. Uh, or other situations as your own, if you're, uh, in fact, my daughter is a, is a film editor, and she works uh, at a computer 12 hours a day. Uh, and she gets up, uh, I've told her this, and, and she does it on her own, but she gets up uh, practically every hour, walks around a little bit, and exercises her legs. So you can't just sit for hours on end. And again, as I mentioned before, those who are at most risk are not just those who are immobile, but they may also have, be overweight or they may have other problems that add to the risk. In general, though, I would say maintaining one's health Maintaining a reasonable weight, being mobile, are also you know preventable are measures to prevent blood clots. How, how useful is aspirin therapy? Well, aspirin uh, does have a mild anticoagulant or blood thinning effect, uh, and it is used uh, for long term therapy in some patients with these types of blood clots. It's certainly not as um, as, as efficacious, not the, the efficacy is not the same as with a blood thinner. It's much less effective, but it's better than nothing. And so it does have uh, a benefit to some extent. Also, 
uh, there's also a small risk of bleeding with aspirin, uh, with uh, GI um, irritation and things like that. Yeah. So you have to balance those effects. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Jack Ansel, for your time and expertise, sir. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Okay, well, um, let me go ahead and introduce you to um, the National Blood Clot Alliance. Um, they have a website. It's called uh, www.stoptheclot.org. So I encourage you to check that out if you want more information about this really good organization. And, and essentially... They're a, a patient-led, voluntary health advocacy organization um, dedicated uh, to advancing the prevention, early diagnosis, and successful treatment of life-threatening blood clots, such as deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and clot-provoked stroke. So I encourage you to check them out. Their website is just a plethora of excellent information, and um, and they... And uh, I'm sure there's ways you can uh, contact them and ask questions and whatever else. But uh, good stuff there at the National Blood Clot Alliance, stoptheclot.org.